Hello and welcome everyone to the Intrepid Museum's live virtual programming. Thanks so much for joining us today for our high flying design program. My name is Alicia and I'm an educator at the Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum in New York City. And I'll be your host today for the program. Just as a reminder, the museum's live streams are free. And if you'd like to support us in delivering these programs, please click on the link in the comments or in the description. So this is a live program. Feel free to use the chat today. Say hello. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Let us know if you've ever been to the Intrepid Museum before. And of course, if you've got any questions, you can put them there too. So today we are going to be talking about aviation and how the designs of airplanes allow them to fly up in the sky. And I'll say this is a pretty fitting topic today, as earlier today we welcomed aboard our newest airplane, the Douglas F. 4D1 Skyray. Now, if you have been following this exciting new acquisition, you might have seen some of our earlier programming about how we transported it all the way from the New England Air Museum in Connecticut over the road on a tractor trailer, then loaded it onto a barge on the Connecticut River, craned it all the way down and aboard the Intrepid Museum just earlier today. This is a very, very exciting new plane for us, not only because it's just a wonderful piece of history from the Navy in the 1950s, but also because it flew off of the Intrepid while it was in service, this exact one. How cool is that? So we are so excited to welcome it back home and we'll be giving you a much closer look at it in the future with a little bit of some cool behind the scenes programming with our aircraft restorators as they begin the process of preparing it for display for you. But before we get started, everyone, of course, I do want to ask you now, this is a special program, we want you to grab two things if you'd like to do an activity with me at the very end. We are going to be making a very neat paper airplane that you are going to get to be able to control in some really cool ways. But in order to do that, all you're going to need is a eight and a half by 11 inch sheet of paper and a pair of scissors. Now, preferably, we don't want to use a piece of paper that you might need later, you know, no important, you know, homework assignments or bills or anything like that. Just a plain sheet of paper is just fine. Plain sheet of printer paper, just like that. And if you've got scissors, great. If not, don't worry about it either. You can actually just use your fingers and tear it at the end too. So without further ado, everyone, let's go ahead and get started. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar, this is the Intrepid Museum. Now we are located on the west side of Manhattan in the Hudson River in a historic World War II aircraft carrier, the USS Intrepid. And as you can see in this picture here, it is really, really big. Our ship is 913 feet long. Now that is so big, if you stood it up on its end, it would be just about as tall as a New York City skyscraper. And it's also so long that you could just about play three games of football on top at the same time. Now, our ship was constructed way back in 1943 for a very specific purpose. It was made during a time where we were fighting countries all the way across oceans. And we didn't wanna have to launch our planes all the way over here in America and then fly them all the way over there across the water because, well, that would just take too much fuel and too much time. So we created these things like the Intrepid. But, but what do we call things like that? Tell me in the chat if you happen to know, what type of a ship is the Intrepid? What do we call a ship that lets us transport or carry a bunch of airplanes while out in the water and even help them to take off and land out there in the ocean? Anyone know? What do you call a ship like that? What kind of a ship is the Intrepid? Well, my friends, if you said an aircraft carrier, carries aircraft, you'd be correct. This is an aircraft carrier. So again, not only can ships like this carry aircraft, but they can also let us launch and land them just like a floating airport. So our ship was in service from 1943 through 1974, and then it later became a museum in 1982. So of course, you know, being a museum, we do like to display lots of really cool things just like these. Yeah. Now I know what you might be thinking. What chairs? What? Why? Why do we have chairs on display? Well, these are artifacts, and they can actually tell us a whole lot about what life was like on board the ship. Now, some of these look pretty common. You know, some of them might look similar to maybe chairs that you might even have at your house or at work or at school. Some of them, though, might look a little more complicated. 
But looking at these chairs is actually a really wonderful way for us to examine a variety of the types of jobs that people had on board a ship like the Intrepid. So when we look a little bit closer, we can make some guesses about them. So we can think about, you know, maybe what they were used for based on just how they look, or maybe if we've seen them somewhere before. And we can also think about where they might have been on the ship itself. So everyone, take a second here. Take a closer look at some of these chairs. And I want you to point on the screen for me, which chair do you think is the most boring? Which of these do you think is the most normal, boring looking chair that, you know, maybe you've even sat on at an office or at school before? So looking at these here, I would say that this one right here on the end looks the most boring and typical to me. So this is a pretty standard looking office chair, right? And it tells us that just like on land, people held regular office jobs on board the Intrepid while they were out at sea as well. And not everyone was a pilot or, you know, got to lift and lower the anchors or anything like that. There's plenty of other important paperwork that had to be done too. And so this is one type of job that we might find on board. And I see piano chance is the green one used as an office chair. Exactly, exactly. All right, now I want you to take a look again and go ahead and point to me or tell me in the chat, which one of these do you think looks the most comfortable? All right, so which of these do you think would be the most comfortable to sit on? Um, you know, maybe something you can imagine you know, like curling up into, maybe you've got, uh, you know, like a cup of cocoa or a book or something like that. Something really comfortable, soft and cozy to sit on. Which of these ones here? When I look at these ones here, I think this one, the brown one in the middle looks the most comfortable. In fact, to me, it kind of looks like a nice comfy like recliner chair that you might have maybe in your living room or even one of those really nice comfy movie theater seats that we're all excited to go back into soon. So believe it or not, these were used specifically for pilots in their ready rooms. Now, pilots had one of the most stressful jobs on board the Intrepid. So the ready room was designed to be as comfortable as possible for them. And here is a bunch of pictures, or rather, here's a picture of a bunch of them uh, in their seats there. You can kind of think of the ready room, too, as like a classroom. So they would learn about their missions there. And even under their seats, they had little lockers uh, for their things. And they had little desks that would kind of come up and fold over. Um, so they could take notes on their missions, and they would sit in these chairs to prepare them for their flights. So it kind of was like a school chair, you could think, but, you know, a really comfortable one. And I don't know about you, but if I was sitting in a really comfortable chair in a really kind of boring class, I might fall asleep. <laughs> now, after the pilots were in this chair, though, they got into another chair. And this is what it looked like, this one. Now, this is right next to uh, those comfy chairs on there. Does anyone know what you would call a chair like this one? Tell me in the chat if you happen to know. What do you call this big? It's kind of this like light greenish looking one to the right of it. It's got all these straps on it. Kind of a scary looking chair. Uh, but I will bet, you know, maybe those straps and all that padding might have something to do with it. Hmm. What do you think this chair is used for? What do we call a chair like that? Well, I see in the chat. Ejection chair, yes. So this is an ejection chair. Piano Chen says it launches the pilot if the plane crashes, crashes. Exactly. So this is an ejection chair. See, a long time ago, if something bad happened to your plane, you actually had to climb out of your cockpit and climb out onto the wing and jump off while it was in the air. So hopefully you had a parachute with you and then hopefully then you could float down safely. But as you can imagine, that's pretty dangerous. And actually, here is a picture of that being used, all right, this ejection chair. So if you imagine you know, your plane's going forward, the tail end of it, the back end of it, all right, it, it could actually get tangled up in your parachute after you jump if you're just climbing on the wing and jumping off. So these ejection seats were created. You'd pull a handle either on the bottom or on the top of it, and then it would shoot you up and away from your plane. So then your plane could go down and then you would be up and away. And then eventually then you could pull your parachute and then safely float back down um, to the water below. So there you go. That's your ejection chair. Now, if you landed in the ocean, sometimes you didn't exactly land near your own ship. And, you know, you maybe you've been flying around and you're a little bit of a ways away. So at that point, another ship would then have to come and pick you up. But remember, all your stuff is back on the Intrepid. So eventually you do want to have to transfer ship, chips and ships and go back. So 
that is where this chair on the end would come in. So this white one on the end here is called the Highline chair. And it works kind of like a zip line. So there is a rope that would go from the top of the chair there. They would connect it, all right, from one ship to the other ship. And then the, it would basically zip you across the water to get you back to the ship that you need to go to. And actually, here is a picture of it in action. All right, so you can actually see someone uh, in that chair, all right, going across the water. And, you know, they've got a big pack behind them. So maybe they've got some supplies or something else that they're transferring between ships. And, well, you know, it looks kind of like a wild ride, doesn't it? All that choppy water underneath it. I don't know. Would you want to ride something like that? Let me know in the chat. So there is actually a funny story, though, about this particular seat. All right. The Intrepid was, again, a very, still is, a very big ship. And it was also known, though, for having some really great food. And something else really exciting, ice cream. So sometimes the ship that would pick up a pilot would say, hey, if you want your pilot back, you need to send us over some ice cream first. I mean, who wouldn't? Everyone loves ice cream, right? Now, the crew of the Intrepid was not about this. They did not want to get rid of their ice cream. So at one instance, they sent over some ice cream, but they weighted it down with soap shavings. Now, eventually, the other ship realized this. They got kind of mad. So to get back at them, while they were sending the pilot back over across that very tight line, they moved their ship a little closer. And look what happened. It put some slack in the line. And, well, they're going over the water. What's going to happen to that pilot? Splash. Dunk the pilot right into the water. So, you know, I guess you could say it looks like that pilot got an extra serving of sprinkles that day. Or maybe you could say he got soft serve, huh? <laughs> All right, everyone. So enough of my bad puns. Uh, if I want to pause here before we move on and talk about more airplanes and things and see if we have any questions about the Intrepid or uh, life on board the Intrepid so far. So any questions? How many people served on the Intrepid? So the Intrepid typically had about 3,200 men on board at any time. Uh, and they were out at sea for about six to nine months at a time. So if you think about it, that's about the length of an entire school year. Also keep in mind that most of them were just about 18 to 23 years old. So that is pretty young. And for many of them, this was their first time away from home. So it was incredibly exciting, but also kind of scary at the same time. Now, it's also worth mentioning that throughout its 31 years in service, no women served on board either. That's just how things were back then. Um, but they did contribute a ton. Women helped to build the Intrepid, first of all, because so many of these men had to go off fighting overseas. Um, of course, you know, we've all heard of Rosie the Riveter, right? So many women took on factory jobs to help to build the planes and the engines during the war, um, many of which flew off of the Intrepid. Many women also were test pilots for many of those planes. So their impact may not have been seen, but it was definitely felt. So great question. Any others? How many planes do you have at the museum now? What a special day to ask that question. So at the Intrepid, uh, we have 27 aircraft on display, including helicopters and the British Airways Concorde, the commercial jet. Uh, but I did mention earlier today, we just received our latest addition to the family, the Douglas F4D1 Skyray, which will make it now 28 airplanes uh, after a bit of TLC, of course, they're going to work on it a bit. Uh, but in addition to that, of course, we also then have a Cold War era submarine. Um, also, of course, the NASA space shuttle, the Enterprise. Uh, and it is all housed within, of course, our most amazing historic landmark here, the Intrepid itself. So lots of cool stuff to see. We do hope you can come and visit and explore some of it. Uh, we are now open seven days a week, so we'd love to see you. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some of the planes that these pilots flew that we just talked about. So this, everyone, is the Avenger, all right? This is the oldest plane that we have at the museum. This one is from World War II. And you might have noticed from the wings on this plane that eh, it looks a little bit unusual. So does anyone know why the wings are like that? Hmm. Do you think they are broken? perhaps. You know, they're not out and extended the way that normal planes that, you, you know, you might see at an airport look like. So um, looks a little weird. Maybe you've also seen birds kind of tuck their wings back like that when they dive, right? They fold them back or uh, even, you know, when they're just sitting there too, they have their wings folded back. But this is an airplane, not a bird, a little unusual to see that there. 
So we as a museum could, of course, intentionally choose to display airplanes, even if they were broken. Uh, maybe we're recreating a scene here where they're doing a repair on a broken plane or something like that. But the real reason why these planes have foldable wings like that was to save space. Piano Chen says, they're not broken. That's right, they're not broken. They are there to save space. So everyone actually at home, if you put your arms out like this, all right, to the side, there you go. Uh, if you put them out like an airplane and you rotate around, all right, you're gonna notice you're taking up a lot of space, right? You might even be bumping into things around you there. But if you put your arms back or up, all right, to the sides in a bit, you are actually quite a bit narrower now. So by doing this on the planes, you can fit a lot more of them inside of a small space, just like the area that you can see here in this image, all right? This is called the hangar deck, all right? And this is where they're gonna store a lot of the planes. You can uh, kind of think of it like a garage for the airplanes. Uh, now, during World War II, they could store about 100 of these big, big planes on the ship uh, throughout the hangar deck and also up on the flight deck all over the place. But of course, they want to save space. So that folding wing mechanism is so essential. And you'll also see that on planes after World War II as well. Really great feature for aircraft carriers. Now, uh, looking at this massive machine, though, you also might have noticed that the Avenger is pretty clunky. All right. It's very large. It actually shared a nickname with a famous Thanksgiving meal. Anyone guess maybe what their nickname was? Famous thing that you eat at Thanksgiving here in America? A bird? Anyone know? Uh, kind of big and awkward when it does also try to fly too. That name, of course, would be the turkey, right? Uh, so yes, it folded its wings back and also big kind of clunky, you know, when it flew. So they thought, yeah, turkey's a great name for it. Now, looking at this, though, you might be thinking also, how on earth can something this big and this heavy get up into the sky and stay there. How does all that metal get up there in the first place, right? So this plane and really all of the planes that we have here, well, uh, you know, they actually fly using a few forces, all planes, not even the ones that we have here, all of them do. And so the first one that we're gonna talk about uh, is basically what I said. There's a few forces at play here and it's the opposite of what you might think you need in order to fly. So what would that force be? What's the opposite? What's the thing that holds you down? Huh. Well, everyone, if you said gravity, that is the reason. There it is. So that is the reason that something big and heavy wants to be on the ground. It is the force that brings us down. So the heavier you are, the more gravity is going to work against you here on Earth when you try to get up and fly. And that certainly also applies to some really big and heavy airplanes, too. Now, it might sound a little bit weird, but we actually do need gravity to make sure that we don't just float away here on Earth. And we have to be able to maintain control of how high we go, too. So using gravity is essential to flying. It is one of the four forces. Now, you might also notice this twirly thing up in the front of the plane. Anyone know what that is called? Tell me in the chat if you kind of know there. What is that twirly thingamajigger? Kind of looks like a spinning fan. Uh, it spins around really fast. Sometimes older planes have one or maybe two or even four of them at a time. Anyone know what that's called? It starts with a P. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as a prop, which is short for propeller. Now, you might have heard of a propeller also being used on another form of transportation, not a plane, but also a ship. And in fact, here uh, is one of the propellers that was on the Intrepid. So we also have propellers to move us through the water. So the propeller spins, it pushes the ship through the water, but believe it or not, air is actually similar to water and that it is also considered a fluid. Now that's not to be confused with a liquid like water that you might drink or you know, go swimming in. That is also a fluid, but air moves like water in a fluid way. So when you're swimming, all right, you're underwater, you're moving the water, you're pushing it back behind you in order to go forward. Maybe you've been watching the Olympics, watching all of these amazing swimmers breaking records left and right, so much fun. But that's what they're doing. They're swimming, they're taking that water, they are kind of like grabbing it and pushing it behind them in order to go forward. And that's actually the very same idea with airplanes and with these giant propellers. They scoop the air or the water and they move it, they push it back behind them as they then are able to go forward. So that next 
that's actually our next uh, force, everyone. That is our second force called thrust. All right, now that is the forward motion that we want to achieve in order to move. And we can do that using things like propellers on the Avenger or propellers on the Intrepid in the water. Uh, but you might also be thinking to yourself too, well, okay, hold on. I've seen an airplane. I've been on an airplane. The airplanes that I'm used to seeing and riding don't look anything like that. The airplanes that I've seen don't have propellers. So how do they move? I'm glad you asked. So here's another type of plane. This is called a jet plane. And this one in particular is called the Fury. It is sitting right next door to the Avenger in our hangar deck. And yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. You know, it does look a bit different than the last one we saw. This one you might notice does not have a propeller on the front the way that the Avenger did. Jet planes generate their thrust to move a little bit differently. So everyone, I want you to try something else with me now. I want you to take a deep breath in and then let it out. Now that is actually how jet planes work. <laughs> they take a deep breath in the front, then, well, they do some other stuff. They compress it, they mix it up with some jet fuel, and then they set it on fire, and then it comes out the back and shoots them forward, and, well, that's how they generate a lot of thrust. So they take it in, mix it up, blow it up, and shoot it out the back. Now, everyone, I'm going to ask you a question, all right? based on what I just explained with these two planes here, tell me which of these planes do you think is faster? Tell me in the chat. If you think it's the Avenger, all right, from World War II, the first one that we saw with the propeller, type one. And if you think it's the Fury, the second one we saw, the jet plane, type two. And as you're looking at these pictures and deciding which do you think is faster, I want you to think about stuff like, well, the shape, the size, the type of plane. Which one do you think is faster here? All right. Type one for Avenger, or type two for Fury. All right. So I see some answers coming in. Excellent. Last, last few seconds here. Everyone get your answers in. All right. And the answer, my friends, is the Fury. Look at that. All right, so the Avengers top speed is 276 miles per hour, and the Fury's top speed is 681 miles per hour. That is more than twice as fast as the other one. And, you know, this has a lot to do with its shape and size, and that relates to our third force of flight. Now, you're going to notice here the Fury is a lot sleeker. All right, it's a lot more streamlined, you know, smoother than the Avenger there. Um, and so that third force of flight is something called drag. There you go. And that is really anything that gets in the way of air. So if you go like this and you move your hand, all right, you can actually feel air resistance on your hand as you're doing that. So that air coming in contact with your flat palm there is causing drag. There you go. So comparing these two planes, everyone, and I'll give you a little bit of a, a tour here of this. All right, looking at this. So comparing these two, you know, you can really also see how technology improved. The Avenger was active during World War II, and the Fury was around later in the 1950s and 60s. The Fury, you will notice, is a lot more compact and sleeker, what we call more aerodynamic. It's got less air resistance running into it than the Avenger, which is much bigger and wider. So it also lets it fly much faster. Now, the last force that we want to talk about has to do with this shape right here. So do you see this red shape here on the side of the wing? This shape here is called an airfoil, all right? And that is what helps the plane to go up. So our last force, everyone having to do again with that airfoil shape. Our last force is the thing that actually gets us off the ground. And I want you to imagine that the plane is moving forward very quickly. The air is going to move towards that wing, but it's got that airfoil shape. All right. So because of that, let's see how I can do this. <laughs> because of that airfoil shape, the air is going to come towards it, but then it's actually going to get split by the airfoil. All right. So that airflow, you can see a little bit more clearly here than what I just demonstrated for you. It's going to go over both the top very, very quickly, and then also under the bottom a bit slower. 
And that difference in speed causes a difference in pressure. And that is going to be high pressure on the bottom, low pressure on the top. Now, the high pressure wants to get up to the low pressure area. So the pressure builds up on the bottom and it pushes up and causes the wing and the plane to go up. And that is our last force of flight, everyone. That is called lift. Look at this, perfect with the Olympics. You got the weightlifters and everything. Oh, so great. Now, you can think of this kind of, uh, you know, imagine you're at a grocery store, all right? You're standing in a long line to check out. And then suddenly, another checkout line opens up and no one's standing in it. What do you think is going to happen? What would you want to do in that situation? You've been sitting there waiting forever. Oh, I just want to eat my, my candy bars or whatever it is that I'm getting, my, my coffee or whatever. This thing opens up. What's going to happen? Pretty sure all of us would say, well, we would all go to the open one, right? So you don't you know, want to be waiting in that line. You can just get your groceries. You can go check out sooner. Air wants to do the same thing. It wants to be in the low pressure area on top of that wing. So the faster you go, the more air you can get to go over the wing and the more lift you can have. Now, on the other hand, the more drag you have, again, going like this with your hand, you can feel that drag. The more drag you have, the more stuff is in the way of the air. And the gravity can then take over easier, and then you can land. So you actually do need all four. So with these four forces in mind, everyone, we can also think then about how planes don't just go forward. They also do other things, right? They turn left. They turn right. Uh, they can do things like corkscrews and loops and barrel rolls and stuff like that. Uh, and that actually has to do with the flight surfaces. So these are the different areas of the plane that the air can hit and how they all interact with the air that's hitting them. So if it's uneven, there's going to be more drag on one side of the plane than the other. And that's going to cause it to not fly straight, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. So everyone, here is an example. All right, I will show you. Um, on the back of the wings here, there we go. On the back of the wings here, uh, these are called ailerons, all right? And they are what give you the roll motion. So you can imagine like a dog rolling over, all right? So to the left or to the right, that word aileron is actually a French word and it means little wing. So it's an easy thing for you to remember there. Now on the back of the plane, horizontally on the tail here, there are more flaps. These are called elevators and they move the plane up and down. That's the pitch motion. So the nose goes up and down that way. And I kind of like to remember that like your singing pitch, all right, you can go up and down. And then of course on the back uh, where you see these black stars on the yellow panel there, that is called the rudder and that controls the yaw motion. That's your side to side motion as though you're maybe shaking your head no. So all of these things together is how we are able to steer our planes. It is a little complicated, but when you add all of these dynamics together, you can actually do some really, really neat things with your airplanes. So before we move on, everyone, and talk a little bit more about some of the other planes that we have here, I want to see if we've got any other questions. Any other questions? There we go. All right. Are Avengers still flown in the Navy today? No, the Avengers entered service in 1942 during uh, World War II, and they were used until about the 1960s. And then at that point, you know, better technology had been created. We had planes that were moving much, much faster. They were also a bit smaller. So better suited, of course, to the changing nature of combat better suited to being on an aircraft carrier. Um, but a lot of those adventures were either then scrapped or sold off. Uh, many of them actually were used uh, as spray applicators for pesticides or water bombers to, to water these massive fields because they're so good at hauling lots of big, heavy stuff. Uh, and so, of course, there are still um, some that are around that have been restored, um, you know, a lot of people's private collections or in museums like we have at the Intrepid, uh, used for reenactments and things like that. But no, the Navy uh, never actually, um, or doesn't actually still use them anymore. That's a great question. But that's why we're also really lucky to have one <laughs> on, on the ship. All right, any other questions? Uh, why are the Avengers wings so big? Yeah, so the Avengers wings are uh, 54 feet wide. Really, really big. Again, we talked about how they fold them 
more like that, fold them back to save space. Um, but they actually have to be so big to offset the, again, tremendous amount of weight of the plane. So um, they typically weighed uh, almost 18,000 pounds at takeoff. And that includes a 2,000 pound torpedo bomb. Uh, and remember, you know, it's still being powered by this propeller. So its thrust isn't quite as powerful as the jet plane with like the Fury that we have here. So having those really, really big wings, it's necessary to generate enough lift that we just talked about, right, to get up off the ground. Uh, they need a lot of that high pressure pushing up to keep it up in the air so that wider surface there really, really helps to do that. Uh, and again, it's all having to do with these four forces of flight. Uh, one last question here. I noticed Sin Tower said, when was the Intrepid Museum formed? Uh, that was 1982. 1982. So we have a, a big anniversary coming up, actually, just next year. Lots of exciting things coming up for that. All right. So um, you know, there's our four forces again. We've got lift, thrust, gravity, and drag. Uh, but you no, know, remember I told you that we used to launch and land planes off of the Intrepid, right? It is 913 feet long. Uh, runways at airports are typically much, much longer than that, right? Planes, of course, need to be able to build up that speed and thrust in order to generate lift to go up. So, you know, we talked about how that's really essential to get in the air. So planes on the Intrepid needed a little bit of help. They would actually use steam catapults to get shot off the front of the ship, kind of like a slingshot, okay? Uh, and it would actually help them to build up speed much, much quicker. Um, you can actually see in this image here, uh, there's a track along the bottom there. So this is on top of our flight deck, all right? You've got this plane going off. That track that you see behind it, that straight line there, is that catapult. Uh, so it's it's attached onto it and then it would just basically go pow and shoot it forward to launch it off the ship, but it wouldn't make that amazing noise that I just made. It would sound different. <laughs> no, landing though is just as uh, difficult because again, we don't have a long runway to land on or slow down either. So they would have to do something a little bit different. They would have to use something called a tail hook. All right, now here's a picture of one on the back of one of our planes. This is the tracer. So do you see it there in that red circle? You've got that black and white kind of candy cane shaped hook thing. All right. Um, that is a tail hook. Now it would drop down and it would snag onto a cable to slow you down from, say, 160 miles an hour to zero in just about two seconds. Uh, and so that would get you to land safely. And you can sort of imagine that like, you know, imagine that you're playing a game of Red Rover and you got stopped, only it would be a lot faster and harder and hopefully you don't lose your lunch. <laughs> now here again, uh, you can see a plane coming in for landing. On the left, you've got that tail hook. It's pointed to, might be a little difficult to see on your screen there, but that red arrow is pointing to the tail hook that has been dropped down. And then on the right, you can see the cable that it would actually catch onto. There were a few of them across the flight deck, so they had more than one chance, uh, but it would slow it down and stop it. So we are seeing right here another successful landing, albeit, you know, a bit of an abrupt one there. <laughs> Now, helicopters also work a little bit differently because they've got propellers on top of the aircraft. Uh, and this red and white one that you see here, the Sea Guardian, was a Coast Guard rescue helicopter. It could actually land on the water. So you can actually see some buoys on the outsides over the wheels that help it float in water. And it, as you would imagine, helps to rescue people from the water. So we could actually fly down vertically to save them and then fly back and up again and away. So the helicopters are something called VTOL aircraft or vertical takeoff and landing because they can go up and down vertically and they can even hover in one place. Now the blades uh, spin on top, giving it, of course, lift like we talked about, act similar to um, an airplane's wings too. Uh, but in addition to the rotors that are on top, helicopters also have a rotor on the back. So the rear rotor propeller can actually face all different directions, which gives the helicopter the thrust that it needs to move forwards or backwards or sideways. So it's got it's up and then it can go all the different directions, too. Very cool. Um, believe it or not, though, there's actually airplanes that can do that as well. Here is one of them. Uh, this, again, is a VTOL aircraft now. This is super cool. It's called the Harrier Jet. Um, you can actually see the vents right in the middle under where the wings are. To me, they kind of look like ribs or like fish gills there. 
All right. So those vents there, they right now they're facing backwards, but they can actually be turned down to push air down. So of course, if we've got air pushing down. Which direction are you going to go? Up. So it can make the plane go straight up. Uh, and then they can be rotated backwards to help it go forward again by pushing all of the air behind them, just like we talked about with swimming. Um, it can also land straight down as well, too. So this really is kind of the best of both worlds. Uh, they do not need a runway to take off or land, which is great, of course, for an aircraft carrier, uh, although they do eat through uh, fuel immensely. <laughs> they go through it very, very fast. So it's not the most efficient plane, but it is really cool um, that it is able to do that. Uh, so now we've got two other planes that I'm going to show you. Uh, and just based on how they look, you can probably get a sense of how they move and their speeds. So check out this one here. This is a long black plane. This is called the A-12 ox cart. It actually was a CIA spy plane and the fastest plane ever built. At top speed, it could go Mach 3. So that means it's three times faster than the speed of sound. That is about over uh, 2,100 miles per hour. And it could actually go so fast, it could fly from Washington, D.C. to California in just over an hour. Now, that is a trip that usually takes about five hours to give you a sense of how fast that is. And, you know, yeah, looking at it, do you see a lot of surfaces on it that might cause drag to slow you down? No, right? It's really, really smooth, right? Um, it's got that really sleek shape that helps it to go super, super fast. And it doesn't have a lot of drag at all. Um, also, it's got some really powerful engines where you see those red uh, rings around the two sides there. Uh, and it actually, that little yellow truck thing in front of it, uh, it actually is the thing that helps the engines start. They have an engine to start the engines. Uh, so very, very amazing plane that we have. Um, very exciting to, to see it in person as well. The A-12 ox cart. It's a spy plane from the Cold War. Very sweet. Now on site, we also have this plane. This is the fastest commercial jet ever made. This is the Concorde. It can fly at Mach 2. So not quite as fast as the A-12, but still really fast at twice the speed of sound. And you can, again, see with this shape, you see how pointy it is in the front, right? How streamlined and sleek it is. It's also got very little drag. So it can go very, very fast, uh, almost 1,400 miles per hour. And it made the seven-hour flight from New York City to London in just two hours and 54 minutes. So again, a really fast very, very fancy plane um, that's, uh, again, these four forces really, really uh, considered here when they were designing these. Now, with all of this in mind, uh, you know, about flight surfaces and how planes move in relation to things like drag, you might recall earlier I asked you to grab a sheet of paper and also some scissors. We are going to make our own very cool paper airplane right now. Um, but if you missed that earlier prompt and you're just tuning in now, no worries. Just go ahead and grab a sheet of paper, just a, you know, eight and a half by 11 sheet of printer paper is great. Any kind of paper will do. Um, and, you know, it can have something printed on it or just be plain. It doesn't matter. Uh, grab that. A pair of scissors. If you um, aren't able to use scissors or have them on hand, that's fine, too. You can just make some tears with your fingers when we get to that part. Um, but. Just in case, I will give you a couple seconds to go grab something like that, and we will pause here for one more quick question break in the meantime. So any questions about anything so far? What happens if a pilot missed the cable for landing? Yeah, so I showed you the tail hook, right, and caught on to um, the cables that went across the flight deck. So the flight deck originally, remember, we used to fly propeller planes, right? So originally, it was a long... They're going to kind of look like this, but a little thinner. Just a long rectangle, right? So the planes would launch off the front, and then they would land in the back. And uh, as they were coming in, um, those propeller planes, of course, they weren't going quite as fast as jet planes. And if they were not able to stop, they actually would have a barrier that would pop up. It was like a net. And so the propellers would get all caught up in that. It might break them, but that's okay. You can replace it. It's you know, better than the alternative of crashing into all the other planes there. Once the jet age came and once we started having these much faster, much more powerful planes coming in, they realized that could be catastrophic to have your planes launch on one side and land here if they couldn't stop because they can't stop with, you know, a pop-up net. 
So they actually redesigned the top of the flight deck of the Intrepid and they angled the back half out a little bit. All right. So now you've got this kind of rectangular shape, but then also there's this angled part too, which is where you're going to be hopefully landing. Um, now, if they missed that, to go back to the question, if they missed the cable for landing, those jet planes, they're actually not supposed to slow down when they're coming in. They're supposed to rev their engines and go as fast as they can. Because if they miss it, what they're supposed to do, it's called a bolter, you actually are supposed to just pull up, just keep going back around, come back around again and try again. So they don't want you to actually slow down. If you slow down, you might just kind of go off and you know fall into the water there. You don't want that to happen. Really, if you miss it, just go on up and come around and try again. You might get made fun of a lot by uh, your fellow pilots there for not making it, but, you know, that's what happens. <laughs> so that that is what you would do. You would uh, go back around and then hopefully catch it on your second attempt. Good question. Any others? Why don't we use the Concorde anymore? Yeah, so the Concorde, uh, which you can see here, was in service from 1976 through 2003. Um, they retired them in 2003 for a few reasons. Um, the first actually was money. So you can imagine, you know, a plane that goes that fast is pretty special. Uh, and they knew that. So, of course, to purchase a ticket to fly on the Concorde was a luxury. It was very, very expensive. And eventually, you know, they just there weren't enough passengers to offset the cost of operating them. Um, so it cost a lot of money to maintain, to run them. And eventually they just figured it wasn't cost effective enough to continue to do so. And so they stopped making them. Um, they were also kind of dangerous too. So unfortunately, we uh, very you know noticeably on, on the news, uh, they were talking about how unsafe they were towards the end of their lifespan there. Um, but you know, there's definitely something behind supersonic flight. Um, a number of people, including NASA, who, uh, you know, are, are looking into it now. They're trying to find a better way to operate supersonic flight like this because time is money, right? People want to get to their destinations a lot faster. Uh, so the faster we can make planes but still keep them safe, the better. So Concorde was definitely ahead of its time. Uh, and we're very lucky to have one of those at the Intrepid too. Come on by and see it. All right, my friends. So let's go ahead and move on to our paper airplane activity. So what you are going to need for this, everyone, again, is an eight and a half by 11 inch sheet of paper and some scissors. So we are going to create a very cool paper airplane that you can manipulate however you'd like based on some of those flight surfaces that we talked about. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over here to another view. There we go. Check that out couple ammo. Excellent. So I've got this other view here. This is live, guys. All right. So I'm going to walk you through how we are going to fold your plane based on having this eight and a half by 11 inch sheet of paper. So the first thing you're going to want to do is fold your paper in half long ways. Now, if you look at a paper, I like to say you've got hot dog style and hamburger style, right? So you've either got like a fatter way of doing it or the long skinny way of doing it, hot dog style. That's how you want to do it. All right. So you're going to fold your paper in half hot dog style, just like this. Go ahead, fold it, crease that down. And there you go. We've got our hot dog style fold right there. All right. So after you have done that, you want to open it up. So the crease is going to be on the inside there. It's kind of like a book, right? You're going to take the top two corners of your paper and you are going to fold them in to that center line. So just like this. All right. You've got a triangle up here along the side. Then we're going to do the same thing on this side as well. So take that top left corner, fold it into the center. So now you've got triangle on top of your fold. So again, if you're catching up, we had our piece of paper, folded it in half hot dog style, just like this. Open it back up and fold those two edges into the center. All right, next thing you want to do is same thing, fold it into the center here. So you want to take this corner and just fold it on in right to the center line one more time. You want to crease that down. All right. So now you're noticing our plane is going to start getting a little bit sleeker here. We've got this very nice line here. We're going to repeat the same thing on this side. Go ahead and fold that into your center line. All right. There we go. So now this is what it should look like. Kind of looks like that, that delta shape there. Maybe this is your uh, 
your Star Trek logo or your Space Force logo, since they're basically the same thing, right? All right, so we've got this. We folded them in. Next thing you want to do then is make a sandwich out of it. Make your hot dog out of this. You're going to fold it on itself. So all your folds are on the inside here. You're folding it in half. So all your folds are on the inside, and we've got this nice triangular shape here. All right, so once again, you have your folds on the inside, folds it in half. And there we go. All right, so nice clean outside on both sides here. Next thing you want to do is take your top edge on both sides and fold it down so that it'll look like that. All right, you've got it like this. Just fold it on down to meet the edge here and crease that down too. All right, so again, all I did was I've got my triangular shape here. And then I take that top edge and I fold it down just like that. Same thing on the other side. Flip it on over. Take that top edge there and fold it down. And then, my friends, you have your paper airplane glider. All right. So, again, you are going to notice now once you have made those folds, this is what it looks like. Very sleek. Very smooth, all right, just like our Concorde, very pointy on the front. If you go ahead and you throw this now, uh, you are going to notice it's probably going to go pretty straight, all right? It's probably going to go pretty fast. Good. This is a paper glider, all right? It is doing what we want it to do. You are going to generate your four forces. The thrust, of course, comes from you throwing it, so that is generated by you. But then you've also got gravity pulling it down. You've got the lift generated from the air coming over its wings. Uh, and of course, the drag eventually is going to pull it down. Now, this is step one. All right. This is our glider. But if you want to make it do some cool stuff, I will show you the next part that you can do. Now, this is where your scissors are going to come in. Uh, you, This is an optional step. You don't have to do this. Uh, but we talked about before how the flight surfaces help it to move certain ways depending on how the air is interacting with those flight surfaces. So the last step now is actually creating some flight surfaces. So using your scissors or just your hands too if you want to just rip it, what you're going to do is cut. Get, there we go. You're going to cut some flaps on the back, right? So you see how I kind of made a little thing here? It's this little this little piece here. All right. Now we don't want to fold this, but you can just sort of like, you know, bend it a little bit like that. So this is going to be one of our flight surfaces here. And that is going to help you to control the pitch motion. Remember I told you before you have elevators on the back of a plane, the elevators help it go up and down, just like how an elevator in a building might help you go up and down. So that's one side. I'm going to do the same thing on the other side again. So again, we're going to just cut two little flaps like that. And again, you can kind of, you know, just bend it slightly. Or alternatively, you can also bend it down. But let's start with up for now. All right. So you've got these two. Another thing that you can do is on the back here, you can actually make another flight. Oh, we can't see what I'm doing. <laughs> another thing you do is on the back here, you can make another flight service here by folding uh, or by cutting this as well. All right. So if you cut another piece here, you can bump that either to this direction or the other direction. And this is going to act like your rudder, right? So this is going to give you the yaw motion, or you can see me on here. This is this motion, the side to side motion. Now, once you've made all of these different flight surfaces, see what happens. Throw it. Play around with it. See what happens if you have both of these on the back facing up. See what happens if you have both of them facing down. And then see what happens if you want to get really nuts about it. See what happens if you put one up and one down. It might blow your mind. Also, same thing with this. You can also play with the different things. And so see if you, you know, you can place a target uh, on your floor somewhere. You can um, go ahead and, you know, try to aim for the target or maybe make it a little bit more difficult and have it maybe do like a spin first to get to the target. And you can go ahead and play around and experiment with your new paper glider. So there you go, everyone. How did your plane turn out? Let us know. Uh, take a picture if you'd like. Tag us on social media. We'd love to see what you created here today. 
Uh, and with that, everyone, I would like to say thank you so much for joining us. Um, this concludes our high flying design program today. But if you've got any other questions about our programs, of course, feel free to reach out to us through our website, intrepidmuseum.org, or also through social media. Uh, also, if you enjoyed this program today, we invite you to fill out a brief survey that we've posted in the chat for you to help us to plan for future sessions as well. Now, our next family program is Thursday at 3 p.m. It is called Biome Away From Home, where we are going to take a look at the important factors that are needed to support life here on Earth and also investigate some potential places out in our solar system and beyond that we might be able to call home someday. So once again, that program is going to be this Thursday at 3 p.m. So I'd like to thank you all so much for watching, for sharing your comments and questions with me today. Uh, the museum presents a number of live streams on a variety of topics, as you know. So please do follow and subscribe to this channel and visit our website for the latest streaming schedule. And of course, uh, if you are able, your donations of any amount help to keep our programs free or low cost. And you can also explore becoming a member online. Once again, we are open seven days a week. So we'd love to have you come on by and explore some of these cool planes that we just looked at today too. All right, everyone. So thank you all so much again for joining us. And hopefully we will see you online for another upcoming Intrepid Adventure. Thanks so much. See you next time.